All right, awesome. So very first Kanban TO meetup virtual edition since all the craziness started. So I'm pretty happy to be able to do this. It's been uh, uh, quite some time since our last meetup and we had to cancel that, unfortunately, given what was going on. So I'm glad we're all back together. Tonight, it's all about making a difference with Kanban. Um, and we have uh, some speakers who are going to basically be telling us their journey, their story of how they made a difference with Kanban. I love this topic. Um, I hear this over and over again in uh, the people I get to meet as they start to use Kanban. It's this magical um, conversation that seems to be happening over and over again. You know, I learned this tool and it became something more than that. It became this opportunity to serve, this opportunity to help others out, whether it's your team, your organization, um, your family in some uh, stories. But these are very common stories I hear about how people were able to go and make some sort of difference. And that's going to be the focus for tonight's uh, meetup. All right. Uh, a few things that I need to uh, cover before we get started. Um, we are using Zoom, but we're using Zoom webinar, not uh, Zoom chat. And so there is one key difference that you need to uh, uh, be aware of with Zoom webinar, and that is how you ask questions. So we're going to be uh, uh, encouraging you guys to ask questions of all of our uh, speakers tonight, and we'll be answering those all at the end. However, in order to ask those questions, you need to use the Q&A dialog. That's a specific place you go in and you ask your questions and that allow us to um, put all the questions together and uh, uh, ask our speakers uh, the questions you have. Um, and you'll be able to look at all the questions. For a regular chat in between uh, each other, as well as to the speakers, you'll use a chat box. So uh, just kind of uh, get to know that there's basically two ways to interact. One is with chat, and if you have a specific question, you use the Q&A area. And Fernando is going to be uh, uh, hosting that portion of the meetup in terms of making sure that all of your questions are uh, fielded to our speakers. All right. Um, one other thing is after the meetup is done, if you can please uh, go in and fill out the survey. You know, we, we, we want to make these meetups better, uh, particularly it's our first online one. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Uh, go in and uh, follow the, the link uh, that's on your screen right now and, uh, and let us know how we did. So that's the meetup survey. Uh, we also configure Zoom so that after the session is done, it'll automatically redirect you uh, to the survey. Uh, but just in case it doesn't, just maybe make a note of, of the, uh, the link that you're seeing on your screen. All right, so our first speaker is Karen Powell, Manager of Delivery and Capability Center, coming to us all the way from Atlanta. And, uh, well, actually, she's not physically here, but... Uh, She's here uh, in spirit and uh, obviously online joining our meetup today. So, you know, one of those upside things with moving our, uh, our meetup uh, online, we get access to some awesome speakers that might not have uh, otherwise joined our meetup. Uh, those that know Karen recognize that she's someone who cares about what she sees and wants to make it better. So I'm really not surprised that she's, um, she's got a story to share. You know, this is someone that I've got to know very well over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, um, I really couldn't see a world where Karen didn't notice something and wanted to make a difference. So I'm really looking forward to her story. Uh, Karen has had a varied career in project management, process improvement, and uh, human resources as well. She has led agile and Kanban startup teams, building operational and organizations from the ground up and actively volunteers in her community. Karen is uh, pretty distinguished in the Kanban community in terms of her credentials. She is an accredited Kanban trainer, as well as a Kanban coaching professional. Karen was awarded 
Phenomenal Women of North Fulton 2009 by the American Business Women's Association. We're really glad you're here, Karen, and welcome. Our next speaker is Shuman Ip, uh, coming to us from Auto Trader, and he's a director of port, uh, portfolio delivery. I have known Schumann for a few years now as well, and we worked together when we were both at uh, uh, working at Loyalty One, um, and that's kind of where uh, you know our mutual interest of Kanban intersected. And uh, I would say Schumann is one of the most curious persons that I know, and uh, he likes to ask me all sorts of questions and uh, those around him, and it's really uh, provoked all sorts of very interesting conversations and taken um, us to, to really kind of um, some new insights. So I'm really glad Shuman is here. Shuman is the Director of Portfolio Delivery and uh, the in-house Kanban Management Consultant at autotrader.ca. He is accountable for all the digital delivery in Toronto and is responsible for elevating auto traders' maturity in delivering business outcomes. Over, here, over his career, he has worn multiple hats, um, uh, focusing on service delivery, but you know, he's been a de developer, he's been in testing engineering, product management, he's been a service delivery manager and an agile coach. Schumann is also distinguished in, uh, he's, uh, he is a accredited Kanban consulting, consultant, uh, the abbreviation AKC, recognized by Kanban University for his top expertise in the Kanban method. So Schumann, let's continue that awesome dialogue tonight. We're really glad that you're here with us. All right, next coming from Newlogy, also uh, out of Toronto, we have uh, Jessica Liu and Jillian Lee. So Jessica is the Director of Product Management at Newlogy. And her goal is to determine how to successfully achieve the business vision with the appropriate product strategy and roadmap. Jessica leads a team of product managers to define and deliver products that delight their customers. She's got over 15 years of product management experience working in both the B2B and B2C space. And last but not least, uh, Jillian Lee, Director of Delivery Coaching at Newlogy. Uh, she works with teams and leaders to find better ways of working and achieving better delivery outcomes. If you are in the Toronto area, you know who Jillian is. She has been very active in the Agile space, um, I don't think you can be part of a meetup and not know or have encountered Jillian at some point. And she's currently planning the Toronto Open Space 2020. So if I don't know if tickets are still available, but if you haven't, it's probably something that uh, you should consider. Uh, Jillian is co-author of the book Professional Coaching for Agilists uh, to be published by Pearson in 2020. And she's a regular speaker at local and international Agile events. Welcome, all of you. So is everyone ready to get started? Thumbs up. All right. Okay, so first off we have uh, Karen, who I am going to uh, pass the baton to and let's, uh, let's hear our first talk. Well, my first question, Martin, is can I move to Toronto? Sounds like you guys have a, an amazing crew there. So thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you to Kanban TO and Squirrel North for inviting me to uh, speak with you today about making a difference with Kanban. So as Martin said, I get very excited. Well, maybe he didn't say excited, but I'm very excited to be here. Um, to speak with you. Uh, as Martin mentioned, as you saw in my profile, I am from the Atlanta area. I work for a company north of Atlanta. Um, called Fiserv. Uh, Fiserv is a financial services technology company and we deliver banking software. Um, we just recently merged with First Data, so we are now recognized as the largest global payments uh, organization in the world. Um, so with that comes a lot of products. We have other, over 800 products and a lot of software development and delivery. I specifically uh, in 2019 was working in the infrastructure engineering group and we had an amazing year with Kanban. Um, and thanks to Squirrel North, um, it's another reason why I'm excited to be here to see my Squirrel North guys again. Um, we were very successful in getting 50 teams up and running with uh, Kanban as well as eight services. So, um, so, so it's really exciting. And so, as I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what do I want to talk to Kanban TO about? 
this today. I thought back to whenever I was a scrum master and I was going to meetups and I thought, well, why do people go to meetups? They go because they need to learn information about things that they care about. And when I went, it was because there's not a guidebook for scrum. There's not a guidebook for Kanban. There's a lot of books, but I wanted to know, am I doing my job right? Um, uh, what does a scrum master do? And I needed to bring some things back to my company that I could take to my job and help my teams and help my company. So for the presentation today, what I really wanted to talk to you about was three main things um, uh, that hopefully for you, you can take away and take back to your companies and it's something that you too will care about and it can help you in your Kanban implementation. So... Let me see if I can make my presentation move here. There we go. Before we start, however, I want to share that um, I've been doing this for about 18 months, and about six months in is whenever I started working with Squirrel North. And um, thank you very much, Squirrel North, um, because the more what the big thing that I've learned in the last 18 months is a huge takeaway is that the more I read, the more information I acquire, um, the more I realize that the more I need to read and the more I need to acquire. So I wouldn't say that it's exactly I know nothing. Thing, but it, this is a continuous journey. And so if you don't take anything away from today, um, or you still feel like you don't know exactly what to do when you go back to your work or your offices, just know that it's a continuous journey and we're all learning together. And so hopefully with these three uh, tips, I can share a little bit with you. So for me, um, I guess you heard Martin say that my background uh, began in human resources. So when I come to Kanban or I come to speaking with teams, it's usually with that human perspective to it. And so when I was thinking back to what are the tips that I would tell somebody in Kanban TO uh, that if they were starting this or to Karen going back to 2019, what would Karen tell Karen um, if she was doing this all over again? And I think these are actually the three tips. So this is what I'm hoping that you'll take away from today. Um, I've come back to you three weeks. Maybe you'll remember these things. Um, but the very first thing is there's no uh, elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. Coaching is key, and it's not just about the board. So what is Karen talking about here? There's no elevator to success. Um, so if you guys are, are like me, which I think many of you are, since there's so many of you here to learn, that you've probably read David Anderson's Blue Book, you've gone to classes, um, TKP, KMP1, KMP2, Campaign Management Professional classes, you read all you can, maybe even watching YouTube videos. Um, and you get excited about Kanban. I know I did. In fact, it took me a couple months to land on this, but once I did, I was so jazzed up and excited about it that I was like, this is the solution I'm gonna take back to my infrastructure engineering group. Um, so I came in and I had, I think I had just come out of KMP2 with uh, James from Squirrel North and I was so excited. But what I didn't realize is that I can't go straight up to the top. I can't take the elevator to the top and start there. I really needed to start with the basics. And as you guys have probably all heard from previous meetings that this is an evolutionary thing. So one of the big messages that I learned through this process and talking with my teams is that we really need to start and take it step by step. Um, and in my experience with my teams is once they hear metrics that you can get metrics from Kanban, they are all over it. And it's, it's immediately the executives, the engineers, you know, they're wanting to write reports. They're wanting to do this day one. So, but, but the big thing is, and the big tip um, in terms of being successful with Kanban and actually making a difference is really taking it step by step. So don't take the elevator to the top day one. And that really leads me to my next thought, which is, for me, coaching is key. Um, and I don't mean that you have to go out and get a coaching certification or anything really fancy. I think everybody here has the skills that you can actually bring to the table um, for these all of these points that I'm making. And coaching just means that is being with your teams, paying attention to your teams, attending their daily meetings, um, answering their questions, educating them and mentoring them so that they can take it step by step. Um, what I've observed, um, well, actually my very first team that I worked with, I had the luxury of having just one team. So I was there every single day at their daily meetings. Um, I would observe, I would give the manager feedback, I would give them feedback, we would go to retrospectives together, uh, et cetera, and they were just, they were taken off. Their Kanban implementation was great. Well, then I had too many teams than I could handle, and that would be another reason why, thankfully, Squirrel North was there for us. Um, that there was only one of me and I couldn't be at every meeting. So what I observed was when I walked away, it was almost like the J curve that you may have heard about, that the teams would 
sometimes throw up their hands and say, this isn't working. Other times they would be doing okay and then they'd kind of go off in another direction. But when I stepped back in um, and I just you know, gently provided some of the you know, old education they had, the excitement that, and all the things they learned from KMP1, they would kind of get back on course. And so a big key to um, our implementation being successful and really sustaining, even now when I have some other roles that I've been given and I can't give them as much focus even now that I would like, um, is that, that that attention and that detail really helps to keep them on track and helps the teams feel um, feel good. And they start taking step by step by step up those stairs um, and evolving in their practice. So coaching is key. So once you've actually um, coached those teams to take it step by step, um, the next thing really would be um, in, is Reminding them during those sessions that it's not about the tool. And this is really the culmination of everything I really wanted to share is that Kanban is to me, and I think to my teams, they understand now is so much more than the board. Um, and this particular point is actually about, it's not about the virtual board, um, because I would say 100% of the, the time, whenever we were talking about Kanban, the questions we got were, um, what's the tool? So there's a confusion about, the tool like Jira or Azure DevOps being Kanban versus the Kanban method. So in that coaching and actually working with your teams to go step by step instead of taking the elevator, um, it's really, really important from my perspective to distinguish between a, a board, which could be for a physical or it could be a virtual, and the method. And so for me, when I was talking to somebody about um, you know, what, what do you think I should speak about here? They said, well, if, if it's anything, it's I must have heard you say 100 times or more is not about the board when you talk to your teams. So, so that is my message, I think, to everybody here is that Kanban is not just about the board. It's not about the tool. Um, it's about the human aspect of it, and it's about the method. So I think I want to wrap this up with just reiterating the key points is that you, you Success isn't, you can't take the elevator uh, to the top to success. You have to take it step by step. Um, coaching your teams is really critical to the success combined with the Kanban method that you're learning from Squirrel North and from your coaches, um, combined with reminding your teams that it's not just about the board. So what I wanna leave you with is this. This is a, a quote from uh, John Gooden, or John Wooden, excuse me, uh, who's a basketball player and head coach at UCLA. He was known as the Wizard of Westwood and won 10 NCAA championships, national championships. Uh, his quote, his uh, quote was, a good coach can change a game, a great coach can change a life. And that's really my message to you in the Kanban community, um, is that if you, you keep that human element in your Kanban implementation, that you really can make a difference with Kanban. So I wanna say thank you again, and Martin, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Karen, that was amazing. All right, so uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions for Karen. Uh, a reminder to use the Q&A dialog to, to ask those, but we are going to be saving them all for the end of uh, tonight's meetup. So next up, we have Schumann. Are you ready to go, Schumann? Here we go. So thank you for introducing me. Uh, so as you can see, this is kind of like a case study related to COVID-19, which is dear to our heart and it's fresh off the press. In the following 10 minutes, I'll be sharing basically the journey of how we're using Kanban to mitigate the negative impact that's caused by COVID-19. And then there's a spoiler alert right there. It's related to system overburdening. A little bit about myself. Um, my name's Schumann. I'm the Director of Portfolio Delivery. Martin did a fantastic job in introducing us ready. So if you want more information or if you, connect, if you want to connect with me, just feel free to go into one of those links or we can connect afterwards. So let's get into the story. What really happened? Before COVID-19 happened, we have a bunch of work streams or lines of businesses. Uh, for the sake of this particular presentation, we're just gonna be focusing on four lines of business. Uh, these four lines of business, they have their own respective delivery teams. So the product managers for each of these lines of business, we just dictate the priority, and then they would have the delivery team estimate the effort, how long it's gonna take, and then the team would just take things from the top to bottom based on priority. 
pretty self-sufficient. And then each line of businesses also have their own Kanban board. During a bi-weekly prioritization meeting, we will call out dependencies or challenge the order of the prioritization. So things are pretty normal until March 2020, when COVID-19 started to impact our business in a negative way. So unfortunately, the business need to reluctantly decide to uh, furlough more than 200 employees. So that's roughly one third to one fourth of our, of our workforce. And then because of this particular workforce reduction, we no longer had enough people to sustain four separated delivery teams. And that's why we need to consolidate the remaining people into one delivery team to work on the demand from four different funnel of works. And as you can see, or as you can imagine, there is a huge imbalance between work coming in and our capability of dealing with this kind of demand. And just a little side note, the size of this new delivery team is just a little bit bigger than the individual delivery team in the previous slide. So that's a huge, huge, huge overburden and imbalanced. This is when we start thinking, hey, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So COVID-19 provided us a significant amount of stress for both the employees and more importantly, the leaders to do something about the current dissatisfactors in the situation. And then with COVID-19, we can have the opportunity to hit a reset button to do something. So what do we mean by that? What do we actually do in this situation? Well, static. Static is uh, static stands for systems thinking approach to introduce a Kanban. So we have done static before uh, as a company. And in fact, Squirrel North was part of our static journey as well. And then they were helping us out to kickstart our static journey and Kanban journey as well. But then when we were doing static back then, it was mostly focused on our downstream delivery, less so at the upstream level. And then because nowadays we have you know, the four work streams feeding into one delivery team, we really need to start focusing on our upstream, starting to shape our demand. And that's why this time when we're running static, we want to focus most of our energy on the upstream process at a customer recognizable level. So we have people like product, engineering, delivery, and some people from shared services like UX, apps, et cetera, to get into the session. So first off, we kind of have a identified the problem. So what are the customer dissatisfaction or the internal frustrations that we have? We could categorize things into two buckets, basically. Number one, clearly priority. Well, back then there are four streams of work and each stream of work have some kind of work in process that's happening. All of a sudden, all these four stream of works work in process need to go into one delivery team. Well, clearly, how do we know which one to work on first, which one to work on next? That's once again, we need to hit the reset button so that we can uncommit some of the committed items. Or better yet, we need to use the word abort some of the committed items that we had because of this huge systemic change. Another thing is, all right, let's say we are magically somehow dealing with, uh, finished dealing with all the work in process. How do we know which is the next item to pick up? there are four separated queue of work. That's why we can foresee that the delivery team will be confused regarding which one item to pick out of the four queues when they have the capacity to do something. Another bucket of problem is estimation. Well, we were doing estimation before, but then previously the estimation were no longer valid because it was based on the previous setup of the team. It was based on the previous understanding of the world. And that's why it's no longer valid. Even if we want to do a re-estimation, there is no baseline data for us to re-estimate our work. And because of this lack of baseline, we we're running into the risk of taking in work without understanding our delivery capability. And as a matter of fact, you know what? COVID-19 actually magnified our estimation or our flaws in estimation. So when we're doing estimation, sometimes it's just using gut feel. So it's not really data centric. And sometimes when we need to start something, uh, sometimes uh, before we start a work, we want to understand as much as possible so that we know what we're committing to. But sometimes we need to start working before we have enough understanding of what that work is. So it's kind of like starting the work prematurely. 
And then there are other times where while we are working, we'll be scrambling, getting information, trying to grab this person and that person, trying to coordinate with shared services so that we can get the information that we need, which should be happened or should be obtained prior to the start of the work. So there's this big cloud of estimation or just at the beginning of our work that we don't know what was happening. And COVID-19 helped us magnify that. So after identifying the problems, we sat together and started to map out our stages of knowledge discovery. What it means is that, all right, we're trying to understand this piece of idea more and more. So we would go from what is the most important thing, uh, the, the high level of prioritization, and then we'll start going into the business analysis to understand what's the requirement, what's the ask, and then go into the technical understanding, and then we'll have a final prioritization and whatnot. So usually we'll map out our current stages, but then knowing that the entire landscape of our market has changed, we can't really use our current stage or current process anymore. That's why with all the people in the session, we co-designed the stages of knowledge discovery. That's not too far off from our current reality, but it's good enough to resolve our current problems. And then we also talk about what is an actual commitment line. We want to be explicit about when we're able to commit to a piece of work instead of just a wishful thinking of, oh, this is some kind of work that's coming up. We are supposed to deliver it or we have the option of delivering it, but we don't know when and stuff. We want to be explicit. This is a particular commitment line. So these are all discussed during the session along with some kind of pool policies, web limits, board policies, et cetera. So long story short, uh, we have had a session and then basically we were doing several things. We were using visualization to get a clearer understanding on the demand going into the delivery team. And then we we're being explicit about our commitments, throwing a clear line in our process when the delivery is committed so that we're deferring a commitment if it's too far, uh, if it was committed too early at the beginning, um, or if it's unclear, well, at least now a commitment point is established. And then with this commitment line or deferred commitment, anything left of the commitment line is now just options. There are no longer commitment that we need to deliver to our customers or to our stakeholders. And then we use an upstream Kanban board to visualize the demand in terms of options that can be explored to define and select. And then last but not least, we're mapping out the explicit policies that's required from different services or different shared services or just ourselves so that we know the minimum information that we need before we could convert an option into a usable customer recognizable product. So go back to the original problem statements. Well, we had problem with they are work in progress from four work streams. Well, with this one view, instead of having four lines of uh, four queues of prioritized items or backlog, we now have one line, one queue, so that we have clear understanding of the priority. And then even if there's any future work coming in, we know exactly what's going to be the next item for us to pick up. And then in terms of estimation, um, we use explicit policy to call the information that we need in order to know more about uh, what we need to do before our commitment. So that's number one, which hopefully we can address the immature starting of our work. And then in terms of the inaccurate estimation, well, because we need to reestablish our baseline, that's why that's going to take time. But we're hoping that as time goes through, we can gather enough information, enough data, and then later on, we can use our historical data to extrapolate and not just estimate, but forecast how long it's going to take for us to finish a piece of work. So what is the result in this one case study? Very briefly, we'll still need more time to gather data, as we mentioned, because just like Karen was saying, there is no elevator for success. We need to take the stair one step at a time. But then as we're gathering data, we're also trying to have people to get good at this new mechanism. And that's why we're not setting up a upper web limit for now, because that might be too much of a stress. We just want them to get used to this new mechanism. And then from there on, we'll, elevate, we'll evaluate 
our process and see how we can elevate it. Uh, but then with one month of work, a one month of data, it's telling us that although we have less throughputs, we're maintaining our lead time despite COVID-19 situation. And in fact, maybe it's due to working on less item, we're having high quality as measured by our production issues. And then there's one, quantita uh, one qualitative feedback from our customer is that they're surprised that we're still delivering things despite having COVID-19. So to sum it up, what Kanban helped us is that Kanban helped us in navigating in muddy water. It provided us with the tool to elevate us from being fragile to being more resilient when we were faced with unexpected situation such as COVID-19. And that's the case study I wanna share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shuman, and uh, obviously a very timely presentation, oh, given I that it's kind of live right now. So um, we're going to move to our last presentation of the evening. We have uh, Jessica Liu and Jill and Lee about to talk about uh, their stories from Neology. So you guys ready? Okay, great. So hello, everyone. It's so great to be with all of you here today. Um, I know Jillian and I are super excited to be sharing our experience with Kanban with you today. So when Jillian and I first embarked on our journey into Kanban, um, I was super, super curious about how other organizations were implementing Kanban themselves and, you know, why they were, why they were um, adopting Kanban. What was this future that they had envisioned for themselves and whether or not they um, actually achieve the future that they had envisioned. So today what I want to do is share our experience thus far with Kanban and Neology and um, share the difference it has made for us. So, you know, just maybe on the slide here right now, um, just a quick few words about Neology to provide you all with some context about the type of organization we are, as well as what our teams look like. So Neology offers a SaaS product helping consumer packaged goods companies collaborate with their suppliers and bring products to market. We're uh, headquartered in Toronto. Um, however, we also have offices in the UK and uh, the US and we have customers all over the world. And in terms of people, uh, we're about 150 people or so. So these are really highly intelligent, motivated, and strong-minded in individuals. Our product development organization is about 75 people or so, and this is across four, four groups and four shared services. So when we're talking about our Kanban journey, it is really in the frame of mind of our product development organization. Okay, so our journey into Kanban. Um, you know, our journey to Kanban was really motivated by a few things, and these were really the pains we were experiencing with our product development organization and the processes with our organization, around, within our organization. And the primary motivator was really the lack of visibility. Teams outside of, outside of product development really lack visibility into our roadmap, as well as the progress of some of the items that were already in development. And they also lack context. So the final result of a product roadmap is usually a series of analysis and decisions. And the rationale behind those decisions um, were often not visible at all. And we also had a scalability issue. There was silo knowledge with a few key individuals. And on top of that, we had inconsistent ways in which the teams worked. So that was really difficult as we scaled and grew. And finally, you know, often the teams required leadership intervention for progress or decisions to be made. And so with those in mind, that's when we started imagining our future. So here's a diagram that actually um, Fernando from Squirrel North drew for us. He asked us, where do we see ourselves now and where do we want to be in the future? So this really helped Jillian and I imagine what our future would look like. So we imagined a future where there would be more visibility, more clarity, consistency, and less leadership intervention so that we can have consistent processes to deliver consistent customer outcomes. And visibility was really a key opportunity here. We wanted to make visible the difficult choices that were being made. We wanted to make the workflow policies explicit so that everyone within the system and outside of the system could understand how work was traveling through the system and also help people know what to expect next. And finally, a future where there's less leadership intervention will really empower our groups to be more self-motivated. So let's take a look now at our uh, a timeline through our journey. So 
our journey into Kanban has really been a multi-year process, as you can see from this. So our story started back in September of 2018. And this started when our CTO and our VP of product established the product development purpose, which we called Rectaco. Uh, and this stood for rapidly and consistently delivering awesome customer outcomes. And this led us to visualizing our work on a very simple proto content Kanban boards, first in Trello and then in, in Jira. And this really worked really well for us for the majority of 2019 as it helped us visualize our work and moved away, moved our conversations away from status updates to really talking about blockers. However, towards the end of 2019, this wasn't working so well for us anymore and we really wanted more. And that's when Julie and I started imagining a future with a more sophisticated Kanban implementation. So in February of this year, right before COVID hit, uh, we had our Kanban training and uh, liftoff. And today, we just uh, conducted our fifth round of service delivery reviews. So in, uh, in the next slide, here you can see some photos from our uh, Kanban training and liftoff, which took place over six days with uh, 28 people um, across eight services. And the people who were involved were product, um, sorry, software development managers, as well as product managers and other product development leaders. So when we're thinking about the principle of change management, of encouraging leadership at all levels, I felt we really exemplified that point. We had high engagement across all leadership levels. We were constantly aligning as a leadership team throughout those six days of training. And I felt, I feel like that was what was really unique to our success. And so, you know, that brings us to today. Um, today, we, you know, we had just, Jillian, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. We had just completed, so when we had completed our training, as I was saying before, we um, that's when COVID broke. So that was the end of, uh, end of February, beginning of March. And so we were just standing up our physical boards at that point, and that's when we were actually all asked to work from home. So the teams had to migrate their physical boards very quickly to digital boards. And I shared a couple examples here. And so actually these are the boards we use today for our combo meetings, for our SDRs, and also as a tool as we're interfacing with customer facing teams. So what difference has Kanban made in Eulogy? So we're thinking about the differences made for both people who are doing the work and for also for stakeholders. Well, I have some quotes that I've shared here, but essentially for two of our services, making the work visible has surfaced commits that were beyond the capacity of, of those teams. And consequently, the, uh, the PMs in those groups rene renegotiated expectations with the customers to reduce the overburning on the system. So which meant we were essentially allowing us to make better decisions for the future. And for our largest service, which composed over three teams, making the workflow policies explicit, allow them to align as a service. So this started during our training and this actually happens, happens continuously during our Kanban meeting. And as a service, they've actually received kudos from our sales and marketing team for the clarity they have provided. This service also achieves our goal of reducing leadership intervention as they have been driving for shorter and more consistent lead times all on our, on our, all, all on our their own without us prompting. Another, another example is um, from our data science manager. She could see um, and point to clusters of work piling up due to external dependencies on other services. So since then, she's gathered the data on delays and brought that data to the managers of those other services and surfaced them on their boards and was able to drive them to resolution. And just one final example here, um, our design systems lead, he noticed that, that one to two items were exiting the system per week. And so he was able to use that to inform his, his team's replenishment frequency. So as you can tell, Kanban has impacted many, many parts of our organization and in different ways. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Jillian to tell you a little bit more about her story. Cool. Thanks, Jess. All right, so uh, give me a moment while I adjust the screen a little bit. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to see some familiar faces and uh, new ones, too. Here we go, speaker notes. Just about there. Bear with me one moment. Alrighty, here we go. 
So um, beyond what people are saying, uh, we're asking ourselves, how can we assess if we're actually going in the right direction here? Um, the, the right direction uh, being the better service delivery. So just like Karen was uh, speaking about earlier, it's not, about, it's not just about the board. So one way to assess progress uh, towards better service delivery is by looking for behaviors. And specifically, for example, behaviors defined um, in the Kanban litmus test. What is the Kanban litmus test? Well, I learned that there are four questions that challenge shallow interpretations of the Kanban method. And today, we're going to look at two. All right, here they are. Question number one. Has management behavior changed to enable Kanban? Yes, and we can answer that question by looking at three behaviors. Okay, let's look at the first one. What are we doing to manage work in line with the service delivery review principles? You'll see our little um, Kanban tower on the right. Um, and one of those principles is to encourage acts of leadership at every level. So uh, as a leadership team, we decided to delegate service ownership to our product managers and software development managers, where in the past, we had been more actively involved in these services. Second, uh, we started with what we are doing now, and we started pursuing improvement through evolutionary change. So those are nice words, but what does that really look like? Oops. Hmm. All right, so pursuing improvement through evolutionary change looks like this. Um, it's introducing deliberate stressors, such as the boards that Karen was talking about, but also about making policies explicit. Um, as Jess mentioned earlier, this was one of the outcomes that we really wanted from uh, our Kanban implementation. Subsequently, we also introduced goals such as all our work items were to be customer rec recognizable, uh, things like defining adoption criteria and setting goals for lead time. So sometimes you think those stressors are just for the teams, but they're, they're really not. They're for the teams and they're for the leadership level as too. So what you'll notice is that in our reflection mechanism of biweekly service delivery reviews, we also had a corresponding by weekly leadership debrief of the service delivery reviews where we do a lean coffee and talk about those stressors and what we can do to start making the improvements or what improvement experiments we can make to improve our service. So the third part of that evolutionary change is uh, providing support. So uh, there's a, the, the uh, training that uh, Squirrel North provided. There was the static workshop that was a part of that liftoff. Um, and uh, there are ongoing consultations between service delivery reviews to enable those managers to bring their let's do something about it moments to life. Okay, so, um, so what about the other two management behaviors? Well, the first one, uh, respecting Kanban system policies. So on the topic of this, uh, is Kanban's deferred commit respected? Well, uh, some work items have been de decommitted after seeing that we had overcommitted. Other work items are being renegotiated. Are whip limits respected? We are seeing initial whip limits defined and related experiments. And are we embracing customer focus as a value? Well, Jess and I have worked with each surface to surface who makes which promises to whom. And I'm going to show you a picture of what that looks like. Uh, additionally, one shared service is conducting a fit, fit for purpose survey. So here's the who makes 
which promises and to whom uh, activity that we went through, where uh, we, we, we looked at each group or each service and our customers, and we asked our, our managers to draw the line between their group and their customers and to say what it is they promised. And uh, this was a really revealing uh, activity and it helped us better understand um, our customers um, and to focus on them. Okay, second question. Has the customer interface changed in line with Kanban? Yes, and we can answer that question by looking at the following three behaviors. Are the commitment and delivery points clearly defined? Well, we have initial commitment points um, and we're actively refining them. Uh, we did that through two thought experiments. So if you remember uh, the diagram that we looked at just earlier where we identified the cu customers, that helped us answer the question, is everything to the left uncommitted? If the answer is no, then it means that the commit point is not in the right place. We also ran the thought of experiment of watch, walking each column to see if it was a funnel activity or a pipe activity gain, aimed to get the work done and delivered. So how else can we answer the question, um, has the customer interface changed? Well, uh, is there a regular replenishment meeting? Well, explicit replenishments are in the goals for this year. Who, how, what triggers it? Um, three, are records of lead times and delivery rates available? Yes, yay. Um, and not just for delivery, from idea to conception. So we're talking about planning, delivery, and adoption. Covering work items idea at the start of the funnel all the way to customers accepting them. And here's, a, here's what it looks like. Um, and I'm really excited by these uh, three, three or four dots at the bottom um, where we're starting to see uh, evidence of a, of a system change. I know we're not yet at the five, Fernando, uh, to, to see scale, but um, I, I, I'm optimistic. Okay. So um, what's next? So uh, one, uh, we want to grow service level responsibility for end-to-end -end value. That's the idea to adoption that we're talking about, which brings us back to encouraging acts of leadership at all levels. Um, second, we want to find more customer recognizable value at a size where we can see more flow and change directions uh, in our investment as needed. Our COVID-19 reality demands more agility. Uh, third, we want to establish a common commit point across services for portfolio planning. Uh, Jess and I imagine a future where there's more even more visibility into the difficult choices that need to be made at the portfolio level. So what about the other two questions in the Kanban litmus test? Well, that's also what's next in our journey. And we look forward to sharing that story with you. See you next time. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I know that um, it's always difficult to have these online presentations without the uh, feedback from the uh, the attendees, but uh, I've been kind of cheering along all the way through. So thank you to all our speakers. Um, it kind of strikes me how, you know, we have these three very different journeys um, with Kanban from our speakers, and that shouldn't be surprising, right? It's different business challenges, um, different starting points, different needs that are arising. And, but we're all using Kanban to understand those, those needs a little bit more. The, the common thing that I saw from, from these uh, presentations was this idea of, you know, visibility to these problems now emerging and this leadership component of someone stepping up and doing something about it. And so the stories sound a lot like to me about the story of someone doing something about what they're seeing around them. 
So uh, I love that. Thank you very much to every uh, all of our speakers. So um, one thing that we've seen in the chat a few times with regards to question about will the uh, the video will there be a video of tonight's talks as well as presentations? Um, the video will be made available. We're going to be sending out an email, or if you are following us on any kind of social media, we'll probably post a link there. Um, and uh, I think the speakers will will uh, share the presentations, or we'll make a decision on that, and we'll send those out if we get them. <laughs> All right. So um, as promised, we have our Q and A section. And Fernando, I think you've got a whole bunch of questions that you need to field, and I'll pass it on to you. All right. Great. Yes. Thank you. So thank you everyone for the questions, and. Um, so some of them are already answered, some of them are still pending, so we'll go through those now. Uh, I'd like to start with one that Horia submitted. Uh, actually, he was asking a similar question both to, um, separately, but similar question to uh, Jess and to Karen. And it has to do with what has been the impact that Kanban has done to your role personally and to your organization. So I don't know which, who would like to take this question and, and, and perhaps uh, you know, uh, share your, your, your ideas. You can go first, Jess. Okay, sure. Um, I was actually typing the answer <laughs> as, um, <laughs> as they're talking. So um, for me personally, I think that um, I have more confidence in the teams because by making things visible and making policies explicit, we're actually uncovering things, right? Uncovering things through data. So I'm more confident that the teams are making better decisions going, going forward. Um, so you know, in terms of how it's impacted my, my role. I think it also allows, you know, me to see that there's better coordination across the things I talked about. We have, you know, we have four different uh, services and four shared services. So I, I feel like we're having some of the harder conversations that we didn't, we weren't able to before just because we didn't know what was happening. So the very first step that I talked about visibility, that's definitely there. And now that we're getting data, we're able to kind of um, have better and more informed conversations. All right. Okay, so how it's impacted me, I guess, um, hopefully you guys could tell that I'm a kind of a passionate person, but for me, I love working with teams. So how it's affected my role is that this has given me the opportunity to work with teams, coach teams, and, and share this really cool method with them. And the flip side is um, I'm, uh, what I've observed in our company is um, some of our teams have said within the very first week that they're seeing more collaboration than they've ever had before. So they always had the standard team meetings where their manager came and shared things with them, but they hadn't collaborated as a team around work. Um, we've seen duplication of engineering work, such as architectural designs and things that where we had teams in individual silos weren't talking because they were supporting different businesses, learning that they were actually duplicating work. So they were able to collaborate around designs. We've seen um, faster delivery areas, particularly like in our network and security engineering where they're just being bombarded with way too much demand um, that they've actually been able to get a handle on that demand um, and um, meeting our customers' uh, satisfaction so and needs. That, so that's the really huge part is our business partners that we support are coming back to us. You can imagine as a shared services, infrastructure engineering team that we're not loved across the company because we can't deliver fast enough. And so this has really helped with that. And then the, the mentioned by other uh, panelists as well is we have lots of data right now to actually show like whenever first data acquired or we acquired first data, however you want to look at it, um, we could actually present some reports to them that actually were telling them what, we're what was going on within our engineering teams um, rather than speculation, which we never had that visibility or data before. So it's been huge. It's been really, really fantastic. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question I'd like to take here is one that was submitted by Gordon. And so he was curious about the situation at Traders. I guess his question is for Schumann. So he was curious about what was the turning point or the breakthrough for the executive team at Order Trader to just value Kanban or to just, I suppose, is, uh, decide to move towards Kanban? I suppose that's the angle of the question. Schumann. Great question. That's actually predated me. So it was before I joined, but what I know is that basically what happened before Kanban wasn't working. So that particular operating model, uh, I don't know if it was Scrum or whatnot, but then it wasn't delivering the right results. There is still an imbalance. There's still a huge inflow of work 
and then we don't have the capacity to fulfill the the amount of requests that we have, and that's why we need to do something about it. And then that's when I think they they reach out to uh, James Steele or um, was it uh, basically some kind of consulting uh, consulting uh, firm? And then they got introduced into Kanban, and that's when they started to hey let's try it out. And then they saw a result, and then they want to focus more on it, and they invest more investment on it, and that's when. Everything got rolled up, and then I got hired, and continue to help them with this journey. All right, thank you. Um, I have here another question that is directed to Jessica and Jillian, and it has to do with um, uh, the question around the level, I guess, of the implementation. So uh, the question is: uh, You have a portfolio Kanban system in addition to a team level system. If not yet, uh, how are you coordinating between services? Do you want to take this one, Jillian? Go ahead. Sure. Okay. So um, maybe it'd be worthwhile clarifying uh, team level, portfolio level, uh, and beyond. So uh, we have teams which uh, do Scrum. Uh, then we have groups of teams that uh, have a Kanban visualization. And um, what we see on the Kanban boards is a customer recognizable value. Where we would like to go next is we would like to have uh, uh, what's called um, a maybe one flight level up meeting. We want to see things um, even more from like a more uh, uh, less granular view. Uh, so we can do some of that uh, cross platform planning and coordinating between the services that you're, that you're asking about. Um, how, how well does that uh, uh, respond to the, to the question, Dan? Um, well, is there any, any other follow up? Uh, somebody's talking about flight level, so it's kind of like the. the yeah, about. that's Todd. <laughs> Hi, Todd. Um, well, uh, then, like then feel free to reach out uh, later if we haven't answered your question. Uh, All right. Um, there is another question here from also for Gordon. Uh, it's not addressed to anybody in particular. Uh, let me find it again. Um, but I, I suppose it could be taken by anyone. Uh, the question is, what was the cost value of the investment that had to be sold to move towards an evolutionary change? How did you choose where to begin the journey? Uh, it might be directed to Karen, but I suppose it could be applicable to all of you. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I was thinking about that. So how was I, is this a question of how was I able to sell the investment in Kanban? Well, I suppose you could take it in, in, in the two, in, in, from the two points of view. Yes, so there is the point of saying, well, we're going to take an evolutionary path to change. How do we get buy-in for that? That's one aspect. The other is, well, once we have an agreement on that, where do we start? Yeah, okay. So I was thinking a bit more of an ROI from an ROI perspective because I got I hammered Martin on that whenever we were working through this justification. So I would say the 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 sales pitch for me anyway, the evolutionary approach to change, absolutely everybody um agreed with that approach because it was um not threatening. Um so we could take some one step at a time. So when I was talking to my teams, when I was talking to my directors, um, even the project management, the PMO organization, you know, they were kind of woo, not so sure about this because it wasn't their traditional pin box structure. But they were open to it because um from an evolutionary perspective, I could explain to them we're just gonna try try this one small step at a time and then we're gonna build on it. So from that perspective, it was it was easy. For the executives, it was a little bit different on the ROI. Thanks to um, the guys at Squirrel North, they put together a really great numbers, uh, a spreadsheet for me that I could eventually use. But the the interesting part about it was the ROI with just a couple of our teams was going to be so huge. Like it was showing like with just the, like within a couple of months of work that we were going to be showing so much savings that I actually couldn't present that because I thought they wouldn't believe it. So <laughs> with like no investment, because there was virtually no investment in Kanban and you don't have to spend any money to do this. So, um, so I would say the buy-in from the teams was huge. The buy-in from the folks that actually were using Kanban was huge. And then when I put this in front of my executives, to them it was a no brainer because they really didn't have to spend hardly anything. It was just a drop in the bucket. And so, um, and then with the results that we've seen, um, 
they love it. And um, so I don't know if that was exactly what you were asking, but I hope that helps. And, and what about the aspect of where do we start from? How, how was that inside? Where do we start? Um, I, <laughs> so I may be a little sneaky. I found a champion and it worked well for me. And um, he had a need. It was our director of architectural engineering uh, or design engineering director. He was um, trying to promote an agile approach to design for infrastructure design. I had just learned about Kanban and I was looking for a test subject. And so for me, that worked because I took this tool to him. I called it a tool. He had an idea. He's a visionary guy. He's like, okay, I'll give it a try. So we got in a room for six weeks. It took a long time. I can only meet with him one hour at a time. We, we kind of did it wrong. We designed his system. We took it back to his team for input. We implemented it and they became my champions. So that was the way that I went about it. And then I started bringing them, the engineers, into my meetings when I was promoting it and talking to other folks about it because engineers speaking with engineers is much more effective than Karen speaking to engineers when I'm a non-technical person. And so I was the salesperson and they were the engineer doing the sales support. And um, they actually shared and championed their story because they saw such great success. They were the guys that actually told me within one week they saw more collaboration and, and uh, delivery than they'd ever seen. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I got it started. And, um, and it worked really well. Right. Um, anyone else would like to comment on their um, experience with evolutionary change? There is another question that is connected to this, uh, is asked by Muhammad. And essentially what he's asking here is, uh, well, we, we know that management and senior management support is really important for this. We need to get buy-in and, and, and sponsorship, essentially. Um, what strategies and approaches would you adopt to buy-in support from the management and have you apply these approaches in a real practice scenario? I think, Karen, you were talking about a little about that. Yeah, um, so... I'm trying to think back. It was so long ago. <laughs> um, uh, um, so how did I get their buy-in? I guess the numbers are really what kind of locked it in. Um, I had to go through the, the, the traditional um, business case. So that was really the starting point of uh, doing the test. So the pilot team showing the results, getting the information on the dollars, um, understanding what it would cost for us to roll it out, uh, and then actually going in front of them with a formal presentation. So I did that with our most senior executives, um, and they were willing to give it a try, again, because it was such a great ROI for them with low cost, and they had some big objectives they were wanting to, to meet that year as well mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, and it was exactly what they needed at the right time. So, you know, timing is everything, and, uh, but, but it was traditional in the approach to get buy-in. All right. So I did some socialization. I, the same guy that uh, was my champion, he was kind of backdoor doing a lot of talking for me as well. So my, I guess my, my recommendation would be to find a champion that believes in it, is willing to give it a try, and has the respect of the leaders also mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, it's a partnership and they can help you socialize the ideas. So he was a huge help. Great. Thank Don't you. lie about that. <laughs> on this topic of ROI, I think Alexi had some perspective as well. Alexi, would you like to share some ideas? Yes, I, uh, so I think Karen gave a great answer to this question already, uh, but uh, uh, I can summarize her experience, experience several uh, other companies. Uh, and uh, to answer the last question uh, that was asked by our participant, Mohammed uh, Ibrahim. So, when presenting this business case to uh, senior managers and leaders, uh, we just have to remember what these people need, uh, what they want. Well, they obviously want to succeed in their business, right? So you basically respond to that by giving them a good business case, right? So uh, Karen mentioned uh, ROI. Well, we sure understand ROI. I think can sure tell uh, a great ROI when they see it. They also like to get a greater reward for the same level of risk, or they like to get the same reward for a lower level of risk. And uh, you can uh, position Kanban that way as well. Uh, the commitment um, from uh, Karen's company to uh, their consultants 
uh, such as Martin James, was actually quite limited. So that limits the downside, that limits the risk of uh, trying out Kanban. Also, the way the method works, it's generally non-invasive. It, uh, you know, when you introduce it, well, you're actually addressing very real agendas uh, for, for change that the organization has. And you don't bring, as a consultant or trainer or coach, uh, kind of more intrusive agendas of some other methodologies. And, um, you know, that limits the organizational risk. And then the organization gets the same reward. And uh, organizations' leaders see that. Uh, and sometimes, uh, as... Uh, all our three speakers, uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, all four speakers in three presentations uh, showed uh, rewards can be outsized. All right, great, thank you. So um, there were a couple of questions directed at Schumann that had to do with the problem of estimation um, that was part of the motivation or the part of the 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 actions that were taken in, 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 in his upstream Kanban exercise. So Schumann, I was wondering if you could summarize the, your answers. I know you've, you've provided uh, you know, full answers in the chat window, but if you could provide a, a summary of these two questions that had to do with estimations and the uncertainty that we have around all this situation with COVID, with, essentially we don't know how long things will go. So how are you handling all that? Sounds good. So in a JITS, we were doing estimation, but back then the estimation was based on a particular setup of a, of a team, of a particular situation, particular circumstances. And when COVID hits, everything changes. So the previous estimation no longer worked. We did need to reestablish our baseline because without a baseline, we can't estimate. Or better yet, we want to use the word forecast. So back then, we were using our basically gut feel to be like, hey, this amount of work, this particular piece of work, how we can do it, uh, roughly this particular size. But it's, it's just mere gut for you. But then that's why we want to use the opportunity to identify or actually magnify the problem that we have in estimation and then trying to resolve it by using a more sophisticated solution, as in using our historical data to project and forecast how long we can deliver something. So to answer the questions that uh, a lot of people have, right now we are not doing estimation. In fact, we're not even doing forecasting because we're currently gathering the data, reestablishing our baseline. And once we have, let's say, a month or two of information, uh, data, then we can start extrapolating on our delivery time in the future. All right. Thank you. And finally, to close, one last question is not directed to any particular member. So any of you take, feel free to take it. The question has to do with the training path or the approach to um, introduce people to Kanban. So what has been your experience and what would you recommend? Especially the question asks about managers. Oh, I'll, ta I'll take this question. Uh, uh, so our speakers tonight uh, have been so great, uh, both uh, eliciting questions from the audience and answering them. So, uh, so I was uh, kind of idle much of the time actually. Uh, that's a contrast to my usual, uh, you know, very busy Q&A box experience. Uh, yes, so, so in short, the path will uh, vary by organization and by its uh, current condition and its size and the budget and the need for change. Uh, so well, that's kind of a consultant's answer. Uh, it depends, but here are some things to watch out for. So. Uh, there has to be a healthy combination of um, uh, consulting, coaching, and training, and there has to be some uh, serious involvement in engaging, engagement design, uh, because both the consultant helping the company and the company itself that uh, wants to improve and seeks uh, consultant's advice uh, need to really get at the table and figure out the design of the engagement, such as uh, in what proportion should uh, you invest in uh, training, coaching, or consulting? In, uh, so what type of training is needed for what person or who are the right people to bring into the training room at what time? Uh, what could be the sequence of 
uh, coaching sessions and consulting visits and uh, approximately activities and what proportion of those do you need and uh, so so watch out for pure training or pure coaching engagements because those typically leave certain risk exposed uh, certain learning modes that an organization needs you know they're not going to get in that type of engagement so look for a healthy balance uh, as for the details, uh, uh, those are usually dependent on the context. Yes, we know in um, some patterns by industry and by size of the company. Uh, and uh, uh, we apply those in our uh, client engagement designs. All right. Just want to add one point there. Um, for full-timers who were hoping to introduce Kanban, we actually, well, actually for me, I didn't really use the term Kanban or ter Kanban terminologies. For example, when we're doing static, I did not use the word static actually. I was using merge portfolio discussion. So they're more prone to, oh, hey, here's a problem. Let's resolve it. Instead of having a coined terminology from a particular framework or method or whatever to course them into using a particular thing. So we're just here to resolve a problem doesn't really matter what it is as long as we have business outcome. That's why that's one of the method of introducing Kanban is to go with what the problem is, resolve the problem, and then when there's resistance, go around it because there are always different ways to tackle a particular problem. So that's another advice that we want to do want to give. All right, thank you. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. So before sending, uh, passing the baton back to, back to Martin, I'd like to, Give a, uh, you know, if there is any final words from any of the of our guests, this is the time. I will say thank you very much for inviting me tonight. I enjoyed seeing all you guys again, and I uh, appreciate all the questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you as well. And then once a wise man told me, well, the wise man is James Steele. He said, Kanban is like a mirror. When you're trying to get a six pack, you're not going to go in front of a mirror and be like, what's wrong with you, mirror? You're going to be looking at yourself and be like, hey, something is wrong with me. So Kanban is that mirror. So when Kanban is not working, is it because Kanban is not working or is it because your current process is not working? So that's something for you to ponder. All right. I love the mirror analogy, Shuman. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks to the Squirrel North folks for hosting this uh, awesome meetup. All right. Back to Martin then. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks for um, the Ken Mantio volunteers and organizers for helping us set up today's meetup. All right, thank you speakers. Um, you know, I could go on all night. We need to have maybe for the next meetup some sort of like follow-up meetup where we uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, but alas, we have to end it here. Um, how did we do? How can we make the next meetup better? Just a reminder to please fill out the survey, tell us how we did. Uh, if we did great, fantastic, let us know why. Uh, if we didn't do so well in some areas, let us know as well so we can uh, uh, correct that for next time. Uh, again, a huge thank you to our speakers. And with that, I uh, bid you good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.